Hello, and welcome to theCUBE's special coverage of AWS DC Summit, formerly the Public Sector Summit. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE in Palo Alto, California, going all the way across the country, remote to DC. We have Allison Smith, Director of Generative AI, lead at Booz Allen Hamilton. Allison, thank you for coming on theCUBE. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. It's great to have you as a remote guest and correspondent for theCUBE. Booz Allen, and we, Booz Allen and Hamilton, we've covered, you guys do great business with the government, really well-respected firm, you guys are the top shelf. You guys are on the front lines. What's the vibe this year at the DC Summit? Because it's not the public sector summit anymore, it's the DC Summit, it's got a broader aperture, it's got commercial. Why the change, what's the vibe there? What's the story? I mean, there's a lot of energy here. I mean, when I walked in, there was, I think that's like over 10,000 participants, and it's just, there's kind of this collective energy throughout the room that everyone's really excited about AI. Everyone is super interested in generative AI, which is obviously great. If you look at the agenda, I mean, probably over 50% of the sessions are generative AI focused. Uh, and so you're seeing a lot of different perspectives come together today, and uh, it's been great. What's your guys' relationship with AWS and Amazon Bedrock? How's that going? Could you share some, some projects you're working on and what are some of the news that's going on in the show? What specific things are you working on? Mission critical applications, mission specific? What's the, what's the focus with Bedrock and AWS and Booz Allen Hamilton? Yeah, sure. So Booz Allen Hamilton has our generative AI competency with AWS. And we're also the first and premier partner for the Generative AI um, Innovation Alliance program. And so we're really excited to be here today with AWS. As you know, lots of our clients are using AWS Cloud. And so it's a very natural partnership to help our clients understand how to use Bedrock services, SageMaker when Bedrock's not available, and kind of the whole spectrum of services. Uh, you asked a little bit about what our clients are doing. and. Honestly, there's quite a big range. You have clients, depending on their maturity, who are interested in prototyping rapidly to understand kind of the value of generative AI and just to assess high level what that ROI might look like. And then you have clients that are looking all the way into full productionized systems and how to start incorporating LLMs there. So one of the things we've been seeing on our research we've been publishing on theCUBE and CUBE research is um, the majority of initiatives are, are evaluation mode, people are scoping projects. And the second thing that's happening is that there's kind of like a, I won't say stalling, but a focus on governance and security and privacy of the data. And then finally budgets are starting to form. It's not like they're stealing budgets from other departments and putting it to Gen AI. This year we're seeing a line of sight into really defined AI, generate AI budget. So experimental, tire kicking, building out and scoping, concern around governance, privacy and security, and then now budgets are forming. What's your reaction to that? Can you share how that's changing and is accelerating? And what's, the, what's, what's going on there? It's definitely accelerating. Uh, but what's interesting is those three pillars that you're describing are all happening concurrently which obviously makes it really challenging because they are all sort of independent or dependent on each other. And so with experiments, obviously, you kind of need to understand the bounds of what your LLM or your generative AI solution can do. Uh, and in doing so, that also obviously has cost implications because as you mentioned with budgets, it's not like they're suddenly increasing budgets by 20, 30%, they have to reallocate. And so when you look at you know, traditional AI systems, you have to understand where it makes sense to bring in generative AI, where it's actually valuable. And so there's that exploration happening that sort of goes back and forth between the budget discussions as well as the experimental kind of options. And then lastly with that, I don't think anyone's really wrapped their head around once you've productionized a system and people are using the generative AI solution, how much is that inference going to cost you know, every single day as everyone kind of interacts with that system? And so those parts are really interesting. Now I want to touch really briefly on that responsible AI governance stuff because uh, with the executive order, with various you know, uh, policies coming out and guidelines, it is kind of difficult to uh, dis kind of implement it, I think, in a very um, rigorous and technical way. And so there are a lot of starts and stops that are happening with different generative AI projects because everyone wants to do things responsibly, uh, but a lot of the research for responsible AI and governance um, is still sort of high level and we're sort of helping our clients think through the implications and what that means for security, what that means for guardrails, um, more at the technical solution level, and that takes time. 
it's hard to figure out guardrails and, and policy when you have fundamental underlying changes with data structures and the infrastructure at the same time, and the use cases are evolving. So the complexities are multifold, multiple dimensions. I want to ask you specifically around how what's changed in the data science, data processing from just a few years ago, you're looking at uh, use cases now where you have multiple data science, data interactions around foundation models across environments. It could be public private sector, it could be all within private sector, public sector, secure data. There's a real focus, it's not just yesterday's data processing problem in and, and enablement around those analytics. There's a lot of interaction around data. How you guys look at that and what's your vision? Oh, that's a great question. So data is always probably the most important thing here. Um, even with the expanded capabilities of these generative AI systems and these LLMs, the data aspect is still really important. And I think even if some of the tasks are no longer downstream traditional data science tasks, a lot of the data engineering and the data processing and even the data intuition um, is still really needed to operate these generative AI systems effectively. And so we're actually able to upskill a lot of our uh, workforce, in fact, you know, Booz Allen has a ton of a AI trainings. We have over 10,000 trained professionals who are upskilling to sort of take their data instincts and their data science backgrounds and start translating in that, that into more generative AI thinking. I want to ask you a question about what your role is and what you guys are doing there, because it's interesting. We see that AI is going, generative AI is being infused in all aspects of the infrastructure, middleware and application across all facets of the organizations and enterprises and government. But there, there isn't yet a chief generative AI person yet because how do you do that? But what's emerging is though, leadership around being a cheerleader and a coach and an architect. So you're starting to see these internal organizations form where people are trying to understand the scope scale cost of how to rapidly deploy generative AI applications, which require a lot of underlying changes in infrastructure and data. Are you seeing the same thing where the internal customers inside Booz Allen and your end user customers are starting to really ramp up. And can you share any insights you might share around that power dynamic around someone who's going to lead the efforts to deploy everywhere? That's a great question. So I, I do want to distinguish, um, despite the excitement and the promise in value that generative AI has, Traditional AI still has a place. And so a lot of existing kind of uh, chief data officers, even chief AI officers, are getting smart on generative AI, but I don't think we necessarily need one distinct kind of generative AI officer overseeing all of it. I think the first step would be around education and getting people who are already doing AI a little bit smarter on generative AI and how it's different. Uh, some of the implications around risk, data, um, processing, and even cost, as you've mentioned, especially running inference. Um, and so we're not seeing you know, distinct roles for just generative AI, uh, but it's more refocusing existing AI teams to better understand and work with generative AI. So you're saying, so more like center of excellence env environments are emerging where best practices are shared. Is that kind of, kind of the, the situation? That's exactly right. Um, and a lot of the times, you know, an AI center of excellence already exists and you can create kind of a generative AI branch within that. Um, and that's what we're seeing a lot more of than its own distinct organization. Well, certainly AWS has got a lot of uh, promotion behind it. They put $50 million into generative AI for impact initiatives in public sector organizations. How are you guys t tapping into that? Are you tapping into that momentum? And how, do you, how are you seeing the acceleration hitting? Is it what has to uh, happen to keep the acceleration going or remove any bottlenecks? Yeah, so we definitely are seeing that acceleration. I, I mean, AWS is absolutely, you know, making a great decision in investing in the public sector. There's so much data, there's really mission critical uh, use cases that can benefit greatly from generative AI systems. Uh, and so the acceleration absolutely is happening. Um, I think it's, I think the biggest challenge, and I don't want to call it a barrier because it's important, is thinking through those responsible AI and governance um, measures. And 
being the federal government, being in the public sector, there is a higher standard for how you are operating with taxpayer money to achieve various critical missions uh, that might not exist for a traditional, you know, retail industry. And so I think that part might be slowing down adoption, but I think that's by design and not necessarily a barrier. A lot of work to be done on data uh, lineage and data supply chain, explainability, certainly huge. I think that has to be nailed first. Allison, really appreciate you taking the time. Final question for you, as a reporter for theCUBE and SiliconANGLE on the ground for us today, what's the, if you're the reporter for us, what's the top story uh, at the DC Summit? What's the headline? What's the big story that needs to be told? Oh, that's a good one. I, I think what I'm seeing is, Everyone is working on very similar problems and they, they look like variations of the same. And I think that should be a good direction for everyone to look in, in terms of how to work with your own enterprise data using generative AI systems. I mean, that's definitely the theme. Everyone wants to use generative AI um, that's currently commercially available for individual licenses, but on their specific data. Um, and so everything that we're seeing here is how to do that securely, how to do that effectively, how to do that at scale uh, and within reasonable costs. Humans, workloads, workflows, data, all the now the new intellectual property, Generative AI is a dream scenario. Allison, thank you so much for coming on. Director of Generative AI Lead at Booz Allen Hamilton, a premier firm pub doing public sector work in the government for many, many decades. Thank you for coming on theCUBE. Thank you so much for having me. All right, that's theCUBE. Actually, I'm John Furrier, your host here at Palo Alto. We're going all the way across the country to DC to get all the action. I want to thank AWS for bringing this interviews to us and our coverage. I'll be right back with more after this short break.